ones. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. If you will read the bold print, please. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. He gives food to all his creatures. His love endures forever. He remembers us when we are cast down. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever.
On this high Sabbath today, a very special and warm welcome to each one of you. Welcome to regular members, very warm welcome to visitors, and a special welcome to the Kim family today. This is a great Sabbath, we're looking forward to it. The first um, time we will have Pastor Mike Kim as our new associate pastor uh, addressing us in this venue, and we look forward to it. At this time, I just want to make one brief announcement that uh, they will be, remind you that there will be a catered luncheon following the service today. Uh, please feel free, one and all, to come to that catered luncheon and spend time together with each other. And with that, our program will go unannounced. You may be seated, and the choir will sing its first anthem. want to invite Mike and his wife Jean and their children Gwen and Joe if you'd join me up here for just a few moments. Mike's used to being on stage. This is killing the rest of the family. We'll make it quick and try to be as painless as possible. But you guys come up and join your dad and husband on this side so everyone has a good look at you. I just want to say welcome, that's it. You can go back to your seat. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait. Um, the, at the heart of being a Christian is the, is the knowledge that God is our salvation and that God's salvation is past, present, and future and that as we can rest in God's unfailing love, we also see God's salvation happen many different times in many different ways. For my family, one of our times of salvation was when Pastor Mike Kim, senior pastor at Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church, somehow convinced his church to take a risk and invite me to join their staff in 2011. And for my, me and my family in 2011, that was salvation. We needed to come to Vallejo Drive Church. We needed to have a new start. 
I needed a staff who supported me and encouraged me as a pastor. And I found that in you and our staff. My family needed to be around another pastoral family who was normal. <laughs> that, well, okay, that, that was equally weird. <laughs> However, normal for pastor's families. I mean, so normal for pastor's families. Um, people who, who understood this life and people who loved us. And for Gwen and Joey becoming my girls' friends, for Gene and Robin making a friendship, for Mike and I making a friendship, um, this was salvation for us. And when I had the opportunity to come to this church, the hardest part of the decision of whether or not to accept that invitation was to lose the collegial relationship that you and I had and the friendship that our families had. Thankfully, our family's friendship has continued to grow, even as we separated. That's what you think. <laughs> Sorry. Man. Can't, man. Okay, okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. Jeez. This is, this. <laughs> wow. All right. You know what? Actually, sadly, we are still looking for our, our next pastor. We'll <laughs> let you know what we can find. Um, honestly, so in the line of salvation, I'll continue to try to be serious, Mike. I'm going to continue to try to do that. Um, now we believe that, I believe that you are now, again, the act of God's salvation in bringing the good news of what the Spirit does in your life as a pastor by coming to our congregation. That you become God's act of salvation to support me as we team together in ministry along with the rest of our great staff. As you get to know and befriend this congregation that you will become God's good news to them. Um, we believe God is moving. We believe as Seventh-day Adventists that this is an advent of God happening this morning. So Mike, for the last over eight years, senior pastor at Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church, before then senior pastor at Van Nuys Seventh-day Adventist Church, and has pastored in numerous locations before then. He comes with a broad experience in pastoral ministry. Mike's greatest gift is that when you spend time with Mike, you find out he really cares about you that becomes clear very quick. It really does. And I, that is a gift that you can't teach somebody. That's something that just comes from who they are, and that's who Mike is. And so you have been longing after dealing with Leif and I in our cold, heartless, uncaring ways. You finally have somebody who loves people in Mike Kim, and you will find him to be a joy to you. He is strange, he is weird, his sense of humor is questionable, but he is loving above all else. Even better, we get Dr. Jean Kim, who's a neuropsychologist specializing with children, an incredibly amazing woman. Gwen and Joey, brilliant, intelligent, talented, fashionable, cool. <laughs> Everything you would want in children, Gwen and Joey are becoming those. And we are glad that you are here. What I want to say to Mike is you need to get to work. We need a lot of help, so get to it right now. To Jean, Gwen, and Joey, we have nothing to expect of you. Our hope is just that we will become for you in time a loving church family that will be grace and support and encouragement to you, however we can be that. And so we will do our best to love you 
while we work your dad and husband to death. <laughs> and so in that line, we have gifts. We have none for your husband or father, but we have gifts for the rest of you. And I'd like to invite Kathy Glennie to come forward and present these gifts. And then I'm going to ask you as a congregation if you would like to express your welcome in some sort of effusive, loud way. Okay, you can go. I just want to say thank you for coming, all of you. It's not the easiest thing in the world to leave where you're comfortable and come to a new place. We promise you, we will open our hearts to you and love you. Thanks so much. Wonderful to have you here, Mike. Good. I want the congregation to follow along in the bulletin as we, we commit our new pastor to Glendale City Church. And uh, share with me in the, uh, in the reading. We've come together today to welcome Pastor Mike Kim, who's been chosen to serve as associate pastor of Glendale City Church. We believe that he is well qualified and that he's been prayerfully selected. Pastor Kim, do you, in the presence of the congregation, commit yourself to this new trust and responsibility? I do. Will you who witness this beginning support and uphold Pastor Kim in this ministry? Thank you. Welcome. At this time, we're going to have a prayer of dedication for Pastor Mike, and I would like to invite anyone here who has been committed to ministry and ordination, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a church elder, whether you're a church deacon, if you would join us. We're going to meet down here on the floor, and I'm just going to ask those of, us, those of you who are ministers to join us here as we pray and lay hands on Mike. So our deacons, elders, anyone who would like to join in this prayer, please come forward. And let's find, a, as I always like to say, an appropriate place of placing hands on you. We will place hands on you, and we will pray for you at this time. Eternal God, we thank you this morning for this church called to serve this city and its communities. We thank you for its rich history and for the congregation that today makes up its membership. We thank you for the faith you have given us on our spiritual journeys and for the passion of your love which warms each of our hearts. May we, your church members, through the preaching of your word and the ministry of your spirit, proclaim the good news of salvation. As your evangelists, help us minister to the physical, social, and spiritual needs of those around us, seeking the justice and freedom of your kingdom. Give us eyes to see the ways in which we as your church can make a difference in the lives of those we encounter every day. This morning, we dedicate to your service our new pastor, Mike Kim. Bless him with insight, compassion, wisdom, and love as he ministers to the lost, the lonely, the young and the old, the seeking, the dying, the bereaved, the hungry, the joyful. Give him patience and strength that he may care for your people. Bless him and his family as they join this church family. Grant that together we may follow Jesus Christ, offering to you our gifts and talents. Through his name we pray. Amen.
Pastor Kim, accept this Bible and proclaim God's word to us. Pastor Kim, take this water as a symbol of baptism and baptize in the name of God. Pastor Kim, receive this book and be a teacher to us. May this oil be a symbol of your role as a healer and reconciler among us. Pastor Kim, I'm not sure that this key will fit anywhere. <laughs> but please receive this key and keep the doors open for all people. I don't think there's any more room. <laughs> Pastor Kim, take this uh, bread and juice and place in the celebration of communion in remembrance of God's un unconditional grace to us. Pastor Kim, let all these be signs of the ministry which has been ours at Glendale City Church. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, many times I wonder if I am worthy of the holy and glorious calling of Christ. And yet, I remember that it is not I or who I am, but it is Christ and who he is. And so, Lord, humbly today, I accept the challenge for this new calling for your precious people in this community, in this congregation. So Lord, accept my heart and the hearts of each one here as we dedicate ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
scripture this morning is taken from Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 to chapter 4 verse 11. I will read the unbolded text and you the congregation will demonstrate to the Kim family your enthusiasm for worship by reading aloud the bolded text. <clears throat> when God saw what they had done and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. I am uh, overwhelmed by the intense welcome I have received today. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe I've experienced such thing in uh, all the churches that I've gone to. Is this uh, what you do for uh, every pastor coming in, or is, am I special? Uh, <laughs> You might be interested to know that um, ever since Pastor T Todd left me at Vallejo Drive to come here, which I, I don't think I'm bitter about anymore, um, we have uh, dreamed about working together again. And that's because it's, it's not every day you uh, find a colleague who shares such similar vision and theology. The only difference between me and Todd, uh, besides hair, is, um, <laughs> is that Todd, Todd is uh, actually quite proactive about his vision. He gets busy planning and implementing while I'm just hanging out with people and talking about it. Uh, he's hoping that that will be a good compliment uh, to the ministry here at Glendale City Church, but we'll see. I, I, I'm not comfortable with, with uh, all, the, all the love and, 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 uh, and welcoming here because it, it feels like you're going to expect a lot from me. 
you know? You know, and that's a, that's, don't do that. Uh, let me give you, let me give you uh, an advice. The key to staying happy with the new pastor longer is to lower your expectations. <laughs> Some shared concerns about me stepping down uh, to, to become an associate pastor, especially when Todd used to be mine. Is there going to be some sort of a power struggle? Well, it's, that has never stopped, so there's no difference uh, there. <laughs> uh, but have you considered that, that uh, it's actually stepping up to become an associate pastor? Have you considered that? Especially in the Adventist system where salary is, is almost the same at every level. It is, yeah. Uh, in fact, I think uh, uh, my, my salary is still uh, like $3 more than Pastor Todd's uh, every month. I think so, yeah. Which is totally unfair because he's gonna get in trouble for all the mistakes that I make. Uh, you might be wondering, why have I chosen such an interesting passage for the first sermon at Glendale City? I didn't choose it. This is the Old Testament passage for this week in the church calendar. That's how I preach. I always choose, most of the time, I, I preach from one of the four passages uh, that are given. It's a three-year cycle. You can always know what I'm going to preach about. Uh, even from a, uh, a year from now. It's from one of the four passages uh, for that week. The Old Testament passage for this week is Jonah uh, 3 and 4. And this is the question I have for you today. Do you always like God's grace? Is God's grace wonderful? Amen. Is it always wonderful? Even when God gives to people that you don't think deserve it? Do you always welcome God's grace no matter who is for? Or are you more like Jonah? Are you kind of like Jonah, who did not always agree with God's grace and mercy? Starting with the last verse in chapter 3. Uh, take a close look at this. Uh, we read it once already. And this time, try to determine uh, if, if you can find out why Jonah did not appreciate God's grace and mercy. Because Jonah thought there were not just pros to God's grace. There were also cons. All right. Verse 10 of chapter 3. When God saw what they, the Ninevites, did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. God changed his mind and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Is that true? Can humans change the mind of God? Yes or no? Apparently so. It says it right here. Isn't that amazing? What? But what? How, how can we change the mind of God? I mean, God is God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're saying that humans, these fallible, imperfect beings, can do something to change and alter the course of eternity? Apparently so. What, what is that then? Aren't you curious to know? What, what can we do? What is so power, powerful that it can change the mind of God? What well, says it? Jonah 3, uh, verse 7. What happened there? The king uh, of Nineveh declared a royal decree. Verse 7, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. What did the Ninevites do? They repented. Now, now think about this. Really? Is repentance that powerful to change the mind of God? It is. Isn't that amazing? It is. Look at the, the scriptures all throughout, and you will find it is repentance. It is music to God's ears. 
the cry of repentance. You know, even, even evil humans are prone to respond to, um, to a genuine apology, right? Have you, have you had this before with family members or friends? You know, you were at odds and, uh, and then finally uh, someone said, you know what, uh, honey, I'm sorry. And, uh, and, and what happens? It's just like that kind of attitude just melts the ice. Uh, there's a story of, of two brothers who became mortal enemies. You know, I'm not talking about you. Uh, and and uh, one vowed to uh, kill the other. That, they were that angry uh, because the, the one brother committed an unthinkable crime against his own brother. What did he do? He betrayed his brother's trust by stealing what was most precious to him. He pretended, he pretended to be his older brother, deceiving his father, Isaac, to get the birthright and the blessing only reserved for the oldest, the firstborn. So many years later, they're going to cross paths. And Jacob, the evil deceiver, it becomes anxious. Would he remain alive after he faces Esau again, after what he had done? So he sends peace offerings to show signs of contrition. And, uh, and he braces himself for the worst. But rather than fury, what happens if you know this story? What happens? What does Esau do? He embraces Jacob and forgives him. And if a rugged, rough, an ungodly Esau can be moved to show grace to a repentant heart, how much more would a loving Heavenly Father forgive His children that ask for mercy? So it shouldn't be surprising to us that God changes His mind and shows grace to the Ninevites. But how does Jonah feel about this? Verse 1 of chapter 4. But Jonah to, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. <laughs> does, that, does that happen to you? What God does seem very wrong. And he became angry. The gospel passage for this week also talks about God's grace, Matthew 20. And here Jesus tells the parable of the workers in the vineyard. You might know this story as well. Uh, these, uh, these workers were hired at various times of the day. At 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and, and before uh, sundown. And uh, they were all uh, promised a, a certain wage. And, and uh, when, when the, the landowner started giving one denarius to the ones that worked just an hour, the ones that worked all day long, what happened to them? They were also promised one denarius, but they were expecting somehow that changed. Actually, one denarius was a pretty good deal. But when they received the same as the ones that only worked one hour, what, how do they feel about this? They become angry. This is not fair. I worked all day. These slackers only worked one hour. And even during that hour, they, they were slacking off. How can you treat us the same? We're not the same. This is outrageous. Can you understand how God's grace can feel unfair at times? Imagine the people that were robbed and, and perhaps murdered by the thief on the cross if they had known what God was going to do to save this, this criminal. Don't save him. No, don't save the thief on the cross. Not this guy. Jonah had the same sentiments. God, do not save the Ninevites. No, not them. Do you have, uh, do you have feelings about certain people like that? <laughs> Christians are notorious for having these kind of feelings, by the way. Oh, no, God, not them. No, do not let them in the church. They're no good. No, Jonah says, not the Ninevites. They are Nazis. They are Hitler. Don't save them. 
chapter 4, verse 2 of Jonah. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious, compassionate God. You know, this is not, um, do you, can you imagine the tone? This is not a nice tone. <laughs> Try saying this to your, to your spouse. I know you're a nice guy. I know you're compassionate and loving. <laughs> it's odd, isn't it? But that's, how, that, that's what Jonah's doing here. You know, this is why I'm trying to, I don't want to work with you, God. I don't want to heed to your calling. That's why I was trying to fl- get away from you. Because I know you're gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, and this is a bit too much, take away my life. <laughs> for it is better for me to die than live. You know, I, 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 I can understand Jonah up to that point, you know. I can understand how God's, God's incredible, infinite grace can seem uh, uh, unfair sometimes. But I'm not going to say, oh, I want to die now. God, you're too nice. You're such a pushover, and let me die. Um, I don't know if this is, this is appropriate to say this, but I think Jonah was a drama queen. Yeah. <laughs> Which is also my nickname in my household. He prophesied doom for Nineveh, and now God's going to make him look like a fool by changing his mind. And he doesn't want to look like a fool. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to look like a false prophet. He said it. Nineveh will be destroyed. And now it's not going to be destroyed. What are people going to think about me? What a brat. (laughs) Why would God pick a person like Jonah to be his prophet, right? That's the grace of God. Say amen. God picks, calls sinners, rascals, drama queens like Jonah, people like you and me, to do his work. Isn't that amazing? Let me get to the main idea. Jonah did have a problem. Yes, he did. His attitude is no bueno. I hear that uh, Spanish-speaking people don't say that very often. I'm the only one. His attitude could be detrimental to the cause of God if he doesn't repent also. It's not just the sinners out in the world that God's calling, pleading to repent. It is also people inside the church. It is the prophets. It is the pastors. It is the, the, the elders, everyone that have already committed themselves to God. God is constantly calling them to repent. And see if you can detect what God is trying to teach Jonah in the last seven verses. This is a lot of words, so brace yourself. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided, and this is interesting, provided a leafy plant and made it grow over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about this. But at at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. Are you with me? When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun uh, blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die again and said, it would be better for me to die than live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah said, it is, and I am angry. I wish I were dead. Now, this is key here, verse 10. But the Lord said, Have you been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow? It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? You are concerned about this little plant that you had nothing to do with. Should I, as God, not be concerned about the 120,000 people 
that are floundering and struggling, and also animals. So, I'm, I don't know if you got this. What is Jonah's problem? What do you detect? What is, what is God trying to teach Jonah here through the plant? What? I venture to say that Jonah's problem is a very common one among the saints. It is the same problem the priests and the Levites and the Pharisees had during Jesus' time. It is the same problem the older brother of the prodigal son had. It is the same problem the entire nation of, of Israel had. It is the same problem Christianity is prone to. I think it's something like entitlement. Entitlement makes us feel angry. It does. Because if, you don't, if you're not entitled, there is no room for becoming angry. Because you don't feel like you deserve something. You don't feel like something is unfair. It is only when you feel, start to feel like you deserve more. You know, this happens a lot in church. You know, people that give a lot of money feel like they're entitled to more somehow, more power, more control. And they feel like they should, should have more say. But that's not the kingdom of God, is it? It is not. And yet, we are humans and we are prone to this and this happens to the best of us, even the prophet Jonah. If those evil people, Jonah says, will be saved also. And we say, if those people will be saved, then what was all this torturous keeping of the Sabbath all about? And all the abstaining from the delicious bacon all my life. <laughs> Why should my, my younger brother who wasted his inheritance and, on harlots and gambling be accepted back without hesitation? This is not fair. God's grace shouldn't be wasted on just anyone and everyone, should it? God needs to draw the line somewhere. Somewhere, God. Please allow me to say this today. Praise God that he does not draw the line anywhere. Because if he drew the line somewhere, we might not make it. Anyone and everyone is eligible for repentance. And when we do, God's grace is allowed to do its magic because repentance and only repentance is the portal through which the Spirit of God works within us to give us life afresh. Over and over again, every time we, we repent, God never tires of hearing a voice, a cry of repentance. And how often do we need it? Jonah was already a committed believer, a prophet, but even a prophet needs to repent again and again because entitlement is like recurring cancer that makes us see God's infinite grace as something wrong because entitlement is like dead skin cells that accumulate on your body daily. And unless you get it washed off from time to time, you're gonna to start to itch. I went to Korea recently uh, with my parents. They felt uh, they're too old to travel alone. So I went with them. And, uh, and the place where we stayed in Stoll, so they had a, uh, the famous Korean bathhouse right next to it. And you know, I, I, I remember how my dad used to take me uh, when I grew up in Korea, every couple of weeks he would go and, and scrub me hard. And I, 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 I hated that at the time, but it was, it was kind of, rem I was uh, thinking of it fondly, so I thought I would, I would go in and, and, and get a rub, um, but I did not stay. I got kind of shy, and uh, I start to get self-conscious because I haven't uh, been scrubbed in 38 years. And I was worried about exactly how dirty 
I was. This is what God wanted Jonah to realize. It's not just the Ninevites that needs scrubbing. If you ever become angry about how evil those people are and how much they need to repent, please include one more person in that category, yourself. If we ever think God's grace is too much, if he saves our enemies also, if we ever think there are not just pros but cons to God's grace, then it's time to review who God is and his core values. And this is why, I just wanna add, coming together each week is so important. And I implore you on my first day to commit, commit yourself to coming each time. We need to come into the bathhouse to get scrubbed. We need to come into the hospital to get that treatment. We need to come into the presence of our holy God for that encounter that gives life. Say amen. amen. You know it's not just Jonah who was a basket case. Over and over again throughout history, God uses deceivers and thieves like Jacob, adulterers and murderers like David, self-centered drama queens like Jonah, white-collar criminals like Zacchaeus, prostitutes like Rahab, persecutors like Paul, ignorant, foul-mouthed fishermen like Peter and Andrew, quick-tempered anger management candidates like James and John. And should I go on about how God can use basket cases like you and me for his glorious cause? What all, what did all these people have in common? What? What? Repentance. That's the only thing. Repentance is what is so powerful to change the mind of God. And I'm telling you, today, we can repent. Now, together, once again. Amen. I like our new pastor. <laughs> and my testimony is that that sermon is, that's a core Mike Kim sermon. Let's keep turning towards God. Let's keep turning away from ourselves and towards God. Let's keep God has always turned toward us. He's always opening his arms for us. Keep, let's keep turning towards God. See what God wants to do in our lives next. See where God wants to clean us up next. See how God wants to fill us and use us next. Praise God how he works in all of our lives. You know, I, I just think in response to something like this, there, it just feels like a good time to give a lot of money to the church. <laughs> just seems right. So let's do that. Um, as always, our loose offering goes to support our church budget. You using the envelopes in your pews to de determine where to send what you want to give, you may use that. We have a giving kiosk in the foyer for your credit card. And of course, if you go to our website, you can also plan consistent giving at our donation page on our website. Today, I do want to make sure you are aware of that through the Adventist organization, we are serving and supporting the relief and recovery efforts from the hurricanes and from the earthquakes in Mexico. If you are interested in supporting 
the work of Adventist Community Services here in the United States as they continue to do the work in Houston and in Florida and along areas that were affected by Irma. Uh, mark on your tithe envelope, ACS Hurricane Relief. And that'll go into the fund that will work with Adventist Community Services, which serves the United States and North America. If you would like to give to support ADRA's relief efforts and recovery efforts for those suffering in Mexico, you want to mark on your envelope ADRA Disaster Relief. Not just ADRA, you want to make sure you write Disaster Relief. Writing those specific words will go to the funds that, were, that are doing the work of doing the recovery and relief efforts where all these disasters have been taking place. So thank you again for what you do to support the work of Glendale City Church, the Adventist Church in Los Angeles, and these recovery efforts for our brothers and sisters who are suffering right now. Will our deacons please stand? Our God, we turn towards you again, and we say, teach us grow us, change us, clean us up, replace a little bit more of the stony heart that we have with a little more of your soft, tender, compassionate heart. Lead us to become more like Jesus and a little less like Jonah. Use what is given today now to do that work in very tangible ways for those who are suffering and in long-term plans as our local church ministry continues to think about how people can see you so they can turn towards you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Walk on through 
the rain Though your dreams be tossed and blown Walk on, walk on with the hope in your
May I just say one more time how grateful I am and how lucky I feel and the incredibly warm welcome you've given me. Thank you so much. Thank you, music department, for bringing tears to my eyes. Your music was just heavenly. I, I'm so glad to see so many of my friends here. I'm just, I, I'm just, I am bursting with happiness. Uh, and uh, may God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>